Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Bernardin, and I'm the Associate Director of Gift Planning. And uh, the, gift, the Office of Gift Planning works with our legacy members at St. John's University with the McAllen Society. I apologize as my manager, Susan Damiani, is having a little bit of a technical difficulty. So she will join us when she joins us, and then she will continue with the presentation. So I'm very excited for today's uh, Power Hour series. This is our ninth Power Hour series this, um, this summer. So um, we're having a wonderful presentation with both alumni, Natasha Williams and Paula Anaruma. So I see that Susan has come on. So let's see if she's able to join us and then she will um, continue the presentation. Give us one second, Susan. I do apologize has that. Can you hear me? Always the first. Susan, we hear you, but we just yeah, it just won't show my video for some reason. It's it's not allowing me. Sorry, I did. I, if I can just. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah. Um, sorry, we're having some technical difficulty. Don't know why, uh, but I'm glad to see everybody signed on. We have a terrific uh, power hour this morning with Natasha Williams and Paula and uh, and. And sorry, I'm off this morning. Sorry about this. Um, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to Sue since you can see her video and she can introduce both our speakers. I don't know if she's done that yet. And uh, I'll I'll give it all. I'll send I'll send it over to you. Sue, OK, thanks. Okay, sure. sure. So um, today we're going to have a great presentation about the current how the coronavirus is changing the real estate market. So first we're gonna do um, two presentations. So Natasha is gonna start us off with a presentation on her end and then we'll bring it over to Paula and then towards the end we'll have a Q&A um, where anyone can ask a question. So I'm just gonna quickly give you a brief overview of Paula's, I mean of Natasha's biography and then we will get started. So Natasha Williams is a demo alumni of St. John's University, graduating in 1999 with her CBA and 2003 with her MBA. She is a new NYS New York State licensed real estate broker who has a versatile background stemming from over 15 years in corporate America within the financial service industry in the areas of marketing, sales training, and product development. She's a double alumna from St. John's University, as we've mentioned before, and um, I'm very excited to hear about her presentation. So um, she's currently a real estate broker with the corner the Cornelius Group. She was the managing director of the yeah. US and the director of operations for the NYC Real Estate Investors Association. So Natasha, I will uh, bring it over to you. Thank you, thank you. Sure. So let me go ahead and first say good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining. And I hope everything is well with you and your loved ones. It's warm weather, just be cautious while you're outside, but enjoy. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen with everyone. All right. Awesome. So real estate and the 2020 pandemic. Let's do a quick real estate summary. And I'm talking about some of our stats year over year from April 2019 to April 2020. I'm going to start by saying yes, yes, and yes, it is still a seller's market. I'm getting calls all the time saying, hey, is it a buyer's market? Can I not offer 20, 30% less than the asking price? No, I mean, I mean we're in New York. Let's just be clear, but nothing has changed when it comes to what's happening in the market as far as the sales price. Actually, there's wars, there's bidding wars. There's actually 10, 15, 20 and higher above asking price. I see so many of my clients and so many prospects call me saying, when is this going to happen? Okay, so I don't have a genie, I'm not a genie. Can't tell you when, it might just happen, but it's not happening now. Summer, as they're saying, they're saying spring is a new summer, and therefore that means there will be a lot of activity. So let's just look at this at the stats that I have prepared for you now. First things first, year over year median prices, I said it before, I'm going to say it again, has increased. You're looking at some increases are double digits. 
What has decreased is the number of sales that has transpired, but what has not increased is the sales price. Is that clear? Okay. So if you're looking at Suffolk, if you're looking at Nassau, if you're looking at Queens, if you're looking at Westchester, if you're looking at Rockland Orange and the Bronx, you'll see that the, sale, the sales activity dropped significantly, but you'll see that the sales price has not, okay? Now, there's an outlier, there's always an outlier. Putnam County and Sullivan counties, their median price actually dropped a little bit. Now, Sullivan County, I don't know who's on the line, don't be offended by me, but Sullivan County failed by both categories. Their sales price dropped, and their sales activity, the number of transactions closed dropped. So Sullivan, I don't know what's happening to you, but you know, let's breathe life into you. Come back, come back, okay? But overall though, for the New York market, you're seeing that there's a lot of activity. There's a, the number of houses, the demand is real and it's increasing. Why? Because a lot of people are saying money is cheap on the street. If you look at these interest rates for these mortgages, Listen, it would infuse anyone to start going to buying frenzy, quite honestly, because if you're looking for a mortgage, these are some of the lowest mortgage rates that we've seen for quite some time. And I'm sure Paula can agree as she goes into her presentation, but just a quick snippet, money is cheap on the street, the demand is high and the supply is low. Quick summary on that. Now, so despite this pandemic, we are seeing a seller's market. However, Commercial markets is a little soft and, you know, the city itself, Manhattan, has been soft, but that's a different animal. But if you're talking about Queens, the Bronx, Brooklyn, the island, Westchester, that has not been the case. It is a strong seller's market. Now, let's go into, and I have to say this, as for the whole overall U.S. economy, the housing market is easily between 15 to 18%. It, 15 to 18% is part of the economic engine of America. So we don't want to see that the housing market have a slump. We don't want to experience this. This has been, you know, a lot of people have been thinking that this is a financial crisis per se. And on an individual level, it has been for commercial landlords, it has been. But this is a health crisis not so much a financial crisis on different levels. We need to see that the housing market indicator remains strong and builds up because quite clearly 15 to 80% of the US economy, the housing market is driving it, okay? How's that for ECHO 101? Okay, for that's all for my St. John students out there from or for alumni from the School of Business. And yes, I still say CBA. I don't say TCB just yet because I'm kind of old school. That's when I was there. I mean, I don't look it. Thank you. Thank you. Hold the applause. I don't look it, but I'm CPA. All right. So let's continue. Now, I will say this virtual real estate, I think, is here to stay. And the reason why I say it's here to stay, it's all about precaution. I mean, everyone now knows the acronym PPE. Who doesn't know PPE? By a raise of hand. Don't raise your hand. Well, PPE, it's the personal protective equipment. It's the masks, it's the gloves, it, it's, the, it's the, the booties on your feet. I'm beginning to think, I was saying, sharing with this with Paula, Susan, and Sue before, I'm beginning to think that I might wear, to have, wear a hazmat suit when I go out to sit down with my clients because I just want to make sure they're protected. I'm protected, everyone's protected, you know? But virtual real estate is seemingly here to stay. So what does that really mean if I can just sum it up? Let's talk about showings. A lot of... On the island, they're in phase two. So yes, they can go about doing their real estate transactions and activity in a limited fashion. In the Queens and Bronx and Brooklyn, we're, we're still in phase one. So not just yet, but we're ready. We're ready to take it over, but not just yet, right? Okay. Virtual real estate, that means for sellers, for our buyers. Let's start off with the buyers. You're not going to see a property in person, if you will. The name of the game is see this property online. So there's a lot of different software that's being utilized to help you really see that property. 
hey, is there actually some type of brown marking on the ceiling? And I would see that in person, but maybe not see it, you know, if I'm doing this virtually. And a lot of concerns have been generated out of this. How do I really know I'm seeing what I'm seeing? How do I know these pictures are current? How do I know this is even the property? I mean, come on, let's not take it too far. It's the property. You can eventually see it. But nonetheless, these are valid concerns. We're used to doing real estate in a certain fashion, and that is, let me see the property in person. Now that has not been the case. We have not had that luxury, but there has been software now that it will show the property and it will show you that brown spot. It will show you there's a little peeling paint. It will show you if circuit breakers or this something that's missing there. And don't forget, you do have your home inspection as well. But what I'm trying to say to you is that you can become a little bit more comfortable in this environment because virtual is here to stay buyers. And there are some buyers that are willing to do this thing remotely and don't mind at all from soup to nuts. And then you have some of the buyers a little bit more traditional that still wants to see it. But your first place that you're going to start is online. And that means quality photographs. It means quality videos and even allowing you to play within the video to see every crevice of that home. And that kind of software does now exist and is being utilized. So take advantage of it. Now, if you do have the luxury of seeing a property inside, again, PPE, and know that it should be when I, and I'm sure Paula will say the same, when I have my listings and I'm doing showings or will be doing showings come when phase two starts within the boroughs, don't do open houses. O open houses, it's you're opening to a large population and we don't know them. And now there has to be a lot more documentation that needs to be done as far as that everyone's health, okay? Everyone's health. Don't do open houses, but do what I call semi private open houses, which means everyone is booked in advance. Everyone has a certain time allotment, the most 30 minutes per person. And in doing so, you generate, you're generating activity, you're generating excitement, but at the same time, you're being cautious. You need to know the person that's coming in. They need to let you know, hey, were they ever exposed to COVID? Did they have COVID-19? This information needs to be pr provided because we then need to prepare our sellers with that kind of data. Because it's up to the seller to say, you know what? Yes, it's okay. No, it's not okay. And sellers do not, do not be home. Do not be home. And on top of that, just very quickly, when we do allow for the buy for, you know, coming in person to show the property, your real estate broker or agent should be the only one touching anything with their gloves and have some doors open already in advance. So common sense, kitchen, go into the kitchen, have some of the cabinets open. You go into the bathroom, have the medicine chest open. You go into the bedroom, you know people want to be in your closet, okay? Okay, so then open the door already. So that will minimize anyone having to touch anything, okay? All right, now for the sellers, listen, it's a whole list as to how things will be done differently. And even from the very onset, from meeting or just talking to you, it would, might be just only virtually. We might, you know, virtually tour your home. We might then schedule another meeting to present the analysis of your home. It might be then when we're actually having buyers, I just described for the buyers what would be done. If done in person, very, this, you know, limited time slots, it's going to be semi-private, if you will. We're going to ask questions in advance. Why? Because we're trying to make sure that we, as a real estate professionals, limit the risk to any exposure to the virus. Is that good or good? You can say awesome. It's okay. So, you know, you'll also have the home inspectors and they're going to follow certain rules and appraisals. They're going to follow certain rules. Negotiations will, again, virtual. Even if the lawyer is open to it, for it to be continued to be conducted virtually. So again, virtual looks like it's here to stay. So we might as well make the use, best use out of it and get comfortable. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Now, the next two slides is talking about moratoriums, if you will, tenant moratoriums, mortgage moratoriums. The long story short about this, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, some people were unable to pay their mortgage or tenants to pay their rent. Now, I'm going to go on, move to the next slide very quickly. If that is the case for anyone on the call, or even if it's not, but you know someone, the most important thing here is the Emergency Rent Relief Act of 2020. I even have the senators or the assembly persons that were responsible for having these bills passed. 
So we know that landlords have been hurting and landlords pay, you know, they contribute with property taxes. They contribute a lot to the local economy. So with that being said, if you have tenants and the tenants were, were unable to pay because unfortunately they were affected and maybe they didn't get unemployment at time, or maybe they're still trying to apply for unemployment. And these are real situations that's real, that's happening, that's current. There is an Emergency Rent Relief Act of 2020. It establishes about $100 million, and this is rental voucher assistance. So maybe your tenant's not aware of it, landlords, but landlords, you can, in good you know, faith, show this to your tenants, say, hey, there is this bill that's out there. Talk to your local sen senator, talk to your local assemblyman, Talk to your local councilman, get an idea of what has been established through the government to help both the tenants and the landlords. Because at the end of the day, this is a symbiotic relationship and we want both parties to be safe. We want both parties financially to be safe and sound. Is that good? Okay. Now, for landlords, you having mortgages and maybe there's some difficulty in paying that as well because obviously it starts with maybe the tenants not being able to pay their rent. Just keep in mind that there also is some type of mortgage moratorium and no, it's not forever, but at least you have some time to hold off and paying the mortgages and paying the mortgage. So just keep in mind to talk directly to your lender, whether they be federally regulated, whether they be state regulated and find out what's the extension like, what's the payback light, how long can it be extended? For some of the tenants out there, even work out a relationship with your landlord that you can possibly have the security pay for one month that you might have missed. Of course, you would have to pay back that security over time, but you know, these, this type, what we're in, facing, what we're enduring calls for creativity. And it also calls for us to be collaborative and it also calls for us to work together. So that's the point of this particular side is to say, there's help out there, reach out to your local government and ask what is out there and when will it come into effect? And what do you need to do to ensure that you're a participant in it? Okay. now. Before I hand it over to Paula, I do want to talk about one wave that is coming because unfortunately some might not be able to handle their mortgage. And that could be the increase in distressed sellers. What do I mean by that? Unable to pay the mortgage and not now, but maybe down the road, unfortunately, sometimes that might end up into a foreclosure. What does this mean? For those investors that might be on the line, this might be what you consider an opportunity to purchase properties. The truth of the matter is, while I don't like to talk about it, a second wave is coming. So we're not going to you know, be ignorant to what's going to come down the pike. And there's a second wave hitting of foreclosures of distressed properties. I'm saying this to say, while money is cheap, there's also cash buyers like they say are king. It's happening. We need to all prepare ourselves against that shift, but the shift is happening. So when the shift does happen, we have to be smart in how we navigate that shift. It's important now that you speak to any real estate professional that you know and ask them about that shift. Ask them about what can be done on your part if you decided, you know what, this is a second home or this is an investment property and I wanna hold on to this particular portfolio of properties that I have now, but there's a certain allotment that I can let go. Have that discussion up front. Don't wait till later. Take charge of your future now. And for those tenants who, and it's true, they're out there. I don't like to admit this either. Maybe landlords who haven't done so great by you. They're having a hard time. But maybe landlords that haven't done so great for you. And maybe you're dealing with something very extreme. Like now it's warm. But what if it was it was cold and you didn't have any heat or water was being turned off? Something very extreme. Very extreme. There is this website that's by the housing court called justfix.nyc. You can use that instead of going to housing court in person. You can use justfix.nyc, wherein they'll allow you online to have a complaint regarding something very extreme, like if it was cold weather, not having heat, having the water turned off, things of that nature. So there are ways in this pandemic and even post pandemic that you can protect yourself. Always learn to be an advocate, whether you're a landlord or whether you're a, ten a, a tenant, to know what your rights are. Now, with that being said, I'm going to hand it over to, I believe I'll be handing it over to Paula and to Susan to be doing the introduction. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining on. And I'm looking forward to some of the Q&A that might come out of this.
works. Thanks, Natasha. You can hear me? Okay, good, because I wasn't sure. <laughs> I don't know, it's, things are not working well this morning. Sorry, everyone. But let me introduce you to Paula. Paula is a 1983 College of Business Administration uh, alumna. Uh, she is a native of Whitestone. She got her start in real estate on Wall Street in 1983. And she was trained on, on Wall Street in commercial real estate and now sells homes, co-ops, condos, and commercial real estate. Uh, Paula handles sales and rentals in the Northeast Queens, and she's uh, the broker and owner of PCA Realty. From 1999 to 2014, she turned the office over to a large organization, Realty Connect USA. It's headquartered in Woodbury, Long Island, and Paula's phys physical location is on Francis Lewis Boulevard, only five minutes from me. <laughs> And Paula has a proven track record of successful sales uh, with satisfied and happy sellers, buyers, landlords, and tenants. I know that for a fact. She's a great, great real estate broker. And we're really happy that you can uh, join us today, Paula, with Natasha. And I'm going to turn it over to you now and hear all this great stuff you and uh, great expertise you're going to share with us. Thank you. Susan, Sue, and Natasha. Um, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen again, and then we'll be on our way. So hold on a second. Okay. So the big question everyone is asking is, has the pandemic changed the real estate market at all? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So the, the you know the big question is, will we be able to recover? That is a very important question. Now, how do I? Okay. So I specialize in the areas of Northeast Queens and a little bit of Western um, Nassau County, which includes like Whitestone, Bayside, Flushing, um, College Point, Fresh Meadows, Little Neck, Douglaston. These are all areas that are still in very high demand. And as Natasha said, still a very strong seller's market. When you look at websites like Zillow, who has become unfortunately the voice of, of, of you know, everything when, when it comes to real estate. Um, Zillow is not correct when they say it's a buyer's market because they have said that in several places. This is not a buyer's market. It's a strong seller's market. There's always been a very high demand here post 9-11, post Superstorm Sandy. All of these things really haven't affected our market all that much. And it's because we are very well insulated from the bumps in the road. Why? We have very good transportation, uh, we have the Long Island Railroad not far from us. Um, we do have the local buses to the number seven in Flushing still coming in. Good. Yes, Natasha. Okay, great. And um, then the express buses into the city. So our transportation is very good. And no one really knows when we're going to recover from this. But there was talk that we're in a recession. But now maybe we're not, according to... Moody's chief uh, economist, um, Zandai, he said, maybe it's over at this point. So we are just waiting to see how this all shakes out from the different areas of the, the you know, economy, the business, health and people science. Obviously, the health sector is booming, but there are other parts of business that will really not survive. Some will flourish and grow, you know, especially the, when we talk about the PPE businesses, everyone needs to have these purchase these masks and gloves and this is a business that's big business now. So the, the, the restaurants may not survive. That brings us into the next slide, which is new pending sales. New pending sales, amazingly enough, are up almost 25% and the new listings taken up 20%. So you know, as far as pending and sales, new listings remain well up from the previous month. And that's because we have a delayed spring market. As you probably know, spring is prime time in real estate. However, it is all delayed because of this. So now you're going to see, as Natasha said, we're going to have an extremely busy summer, I hope. <laughs> the next slide talks about um, the housing 
will fare better than the expected severe downturn. Ivy Zellman is a leading housing analyst and she's saying that it will fare better than expected. Very positive outlook for the remainder of 2020 and 2021. We came out of the box in the beginning of 2020 very, very strong. And then we had to literally shift, call it pivot. We had to pivot our business, get on the computer, get on the phone. We couldn't do the in-person stuff. So what does that mean? Now we have to eventually come June 22nd, hopefully we will be out there in phase two and life will begin again for us. Next slide. Um, again, this is an amazing little fact here. Diana Olick, and see CNBC's real estate correspondent said that April's numbers defied the expectations of a huge 22% drop. Now that's amazing because obviously, as Natasha said, people are buying through virtual tours, online, photos, all of which I've been using for years because I just followed what the Manhattan people were doing. They were using the 3D uh, technology and professional pictures. We've been doing that for the longest time. Um, hope you can still hear me. Okay. Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Uh, economic gains, two and a half million jobs just in May. So there are more to go, obviously, with people like ourselves being brought back into the, into the market and the job losses will be most likely temporary as in many cases, you know, there is a number of different ways that you can look. And it will skew the data, but obviously the, the gains are coming, the job gains are coming back, which is going to help everything and the stock market too. This is a, an email that I received from one of my mortgage people on Friday, Paul Papastakis, and I was just shocked at these rates. So favorable. 3% on a 30 year fixed conventional conforming loan is really, really amazing and two and a half percent on 15 years. That's just unbelievable. So if this is not the right time to buy, I mean, I, I know no other time where I've seen rates this low. This is the time to buy. And savvy buyers know this. They're getting out there, investors, money, as Natasha said, very, very cheap. So this is the time to buy. This is what is spurring on the market and there is uh, no end in sight according to what we're seeing. So they don't plan on raising those rates. Uh, real estate again, seeing as more than 35% remains the most favored investment has been the case, you know, again, with the talking about rebounds. So that's national. When it comes to Northeast Queens, we have really not seen too many hits. Okay. Um, Again, evidence mounting that the home buyers may be coming back to the market after the demand plummeted. Well, the demand plummeted because people couldn't get that out there and see homes. So now you're going to see more and more people coming out. And I look forward to not having to do open houses because I think it's more exposure and risk to everyone involved. I myself had a very mild case. I'm sort of insulated from, from this, the exposure, because I, I was tested positive with the antibodies. But that doesn't mean that we can't get it again. No one knows. So I, you know, I just feel that we should all protect ourselves and other people as much as we can. So um, I'm receiving more and more inquiries every single week, phone calls, and I feel that people, especially buyers, are feeling like we're done with the coronavirus. I want to buy. We're talk, hearing of talk of Manhattanites moving out of New York City, coming to the outer boroughs, moving east and north of the city. So that maybe going back to Natasha's slide on the counties outside New York, you're going to see some of those counties numbers going up because there are going to be people buying those areas that would never have thought of buying before because it's so far from Manhattan, but they've changed their mind. They want to get out of Manhattan. They want to get out of maybe the smaller apartments because they want to get into, you know, more quality of life to be away from other people. And so uh, this is also with home prices projected. Then we have Zellman Associates, again, Ivy Zellman, Fannie Mae, and they are National Association of Realtors, Freddie Mac, and we feel that the prices have a very strong appreciating value in 2020, will continue to appreciate. As far as the economy of it all goes, they're talking about a V-shaped recovery 
And then people like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, Wells Fargo all have this projection for the recovery. Okay, again, benefits of home ownership. You know, everyone wants to have a home and people that are investors, they want to have an investment that's well, you know, placed and uh, making good positive um, money. So we're going to get into the commercial in a, in a minute, but um, mortgage demand, go back to this, I can probably see this, from home buyers showing unexpectedly strong recovery. Again, surprise most forecasters. Diana Alec is the um, correspondent with CMEC. So that I believe is my last slide. Just a note about commercial real estate. Commercial real estate, I couldn't get a good slide of commercial because commercial encompasses retail leasing, office space leasing, building sales, and multifamily buildings. I believe a multifamily residential buildings. I believe this area may see a more severe effect of the pandemic meaning the commercial sector. Why? Retail leasing, more empty stores from businesses who may unfortunately have failed, and that absorption for empty stores could take years to absorb. Office space, more people may continue to work from home, as we've all gotten used to, and could impact the amount of space needed by many businesses, bringing up, increasing the vacancy rates. Okay, because you know when the when the businesses look at like I have to pay sixty five dollars per square foot for a person sitting there. Everyone gets a few hundred square feet. Why do I need to have that? You're going to see more job sharing and more people outsourced to the homes. Building sales tied to the last point with less demand for office space and buildings won't be really as valuable. That's all going to change. Multifamily buildings. Last summer there was a new rental policy put in place by the city. Uh, that went into effect July 1st. My son just was about to sign a lease on July 1st. He said, Ma, I'm, I'm saving $400 per month. Why? Because now the landlord, this is a multifamily building, they cannot charge more than X amount over the previous tenant, which came to, in his case, 2%. So if that's being the case, um, that may actually also devalue buildings because what will suffer? I understand there were 60 cancellations for an elevator company once that happened for all the repairs that needed to be done in various buildings because they said if it's not necessary, it's not urgent, we're, gonna, we're not going to spend the money. With fixed operating expenses always rising, such as real estate taxes, elevator maintenance, et cetera, the overall extra maintenance may suffer on these buildings. So who knows what will happen in the commercial sector? I think that's what's going to really bear the brunt of this pandemic more than and more than the housing market because people always need a place to live that's it thank you thank you so much paula thank you natasha that was terrific uh we're going to turn it over to our attendees does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask uh for natasha and paula I still may be having some technical difficulty. I don't know. Do you see any questions right now? I was told that, that we did have some, but I don't, I'm not seeing it in my Q&A box. I do have one. It says, I'm just going to mute everyone. It says, how long has everyone been doing real estate and what made you decide to go into real estate? Do you want me to answer that? Whoever wants to answer it, yeah. I've been doing real estate for 37 years and I had a business degree from St. John's, uh, no jobs in sight. I, somebody that I knew through my parents had a, a position in a commercial real estate firm and I eventually liked the business so much. I got my real estate license and started in commercial leasing. However, I found that the Wall Street <laughs> um, scene was very, very difficult in that, at that time in 83, four women, especially, you know, with being female and no mentor so i eventually branched into residential but that didn't happen until the late 80s and i found that i was a much better fit for the for the residential uh market but i still like the commercial area too so i kind of do both but um you know this is my hometown white stone is my hometown this is what i know best and i can speak, speak for hours about real estate in northeast queens so. 
Before we jump to Natasha to answer that question, just one question on that. Do you feel uh, being a real estate broker, um, it's really important, like you said, you feel comfortable in Whitestone. Do you think that's what makes you a better broker because you're so familiar, you probably know some of the, some of the businesses and some of the landlords in the area? Do you think that helps? Definitely. I mean, you know, I'm very comfortable here and there's nothing you can't tell me about Whitestone. I, I know it so well. And, um, you know, but I do also think that if you pick me up and put it me on the other side of the country in California, for example, I could learn that market very easily. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, there's, you know, there's always nowadays, there's so many ways to, to learn markets. And that's why the consumers have become very, very savvy when it comes to real estate, because they're looking at, at online, they're looking at Zillow, they're looking at now, multiple listing also has so much information about sold prices that the consumers are educated before they even get out. They're not looking at 20, 25, 30 houses. They're looking at five. Mm, so interesting. Educated, which is much better for us. Yeah. I'll, uh, Natasha, if you could just unmute yourself and if you'd like to answer the same question, why you got into real estate. Real estate for about 10 years. years. You can hear me now? Now we can. Yeah. Okay, good, good. So to answer the question, I've been in real estate for about 10 years. And the reason why I did real estate or I you know, started my real estate career was actually having been in corporate America within the financial market se sector, it was great. I love my different roles, advertising jobs, marketing jobs, awesome. However, it came a time in my career where I wanted a change. And I got started with first buying my first home. And I just said, you know, I like what this looks like. Can I do the same? So of course I didn't start right away, I waited. And then when I decided to do a shift, I went in as being an investor first before starting doing real estate sales. And in doing being an investor first, I didn't even invest in New York, I invested in the tri-state area. And then I said, you know what? The more acclimated I became, I started running property tours for different parts, for you know different states. And I started teaching investors what I was taught and what I learned hands-on and doing market research and finding out what's the five-year plan, economic plan for that particular city or that particular state. And will they have like new employers coming in or who are the employers there now? And how many people do they employ and what kind of neighborhood it is? I was fascinated to tell you the truth. And then I said, you know what? I believe that this is God's plan for me. And so I decided, said, this is it. I'm leaving corporate. I'm going into real estate. I start off in doing investments. And then I did a shift and said, you know what? I like this a little bit too much now. It's good to listen to God. And so then I started doing real estate sales. And when I started real estate sales, you know, I know Paul has talked about like the Northeast Queens. I'm Southeast Queens. So Southeast Queens, I have Central Brooklyn because that's where I was born. And when I was attending St. John's, I lived in Brooklyn. So no Brooklyn market really well. And then there's parts of Nassau County that I handle. And so I have just been doing deep dives and being what I believe I know Paula is like you see everywhere you see Paula signage right like everyone on call she's already have known Paula from seeing her signage everywhere is that true or true so Paula is a you know a hyper a hyper what we like to call a hyper local guru right because she knows the area she knows what's happening this the same part for me I did a deep dive and South Queens was it for me parts of Brooklyn because I'm very familiar with it and then part of you know west southwestern nassau county if you will i got started because to be honest i heard the voice of god and it was time to take a shift and i trusted him and went out and did that shift and now my point in doing real estate is helping others it's helping them navigate what's happening we didn't see the pandemic coming but now that it's here it's how do i navigate buyers and sellers to successfully complete a transaction and do it with care and understanding of the market. So now at this point, my role I feel is to be more advocacy in helping people achieve certain dreams or to also help their bottom line. That's great. And it comes across uh, here in this presentation. You can tell you're a very, very good broker, I'm sure. Uh, Thank you. So my next, uh, I have a question actually uh, for Natasha. You were talking about the tenants' rights um, I know with landlords, I was reading something or I might have saw it on the news where they were saying in New York City, a lot of the landlords are really like 
They're not, you know, these these big corporations. Some of them are, obviously, but a lot of them are just, you know, family owned uh, landlords. And yes. now with this law of, uh, you know, uh, Cuomo enacting, you know, I think it's up to August where, you know, if you're having a, uh, a tenant and you're having trouble with them, you can't evict them uh, and they don't really need to pay the rent. What what are the rights of the landlord now? They have to pay these huge property taxes. And where do they get the money? Because the money is generated from the rents in order to pay these these property taxes. So what type of rights do they do they have? You know, it's funny that you talk about the landlords. Just a quick note. A lot of the landlords are moms and pops, their family. They're not the big corporations. This is really hurting their bottom line. And yes, I'll tell you a quick story. I have a client right now. We're going to closing soon, but for about three to four months, this landlord out on, in the island was selling the property to my buyer and the tenants decided to stay there because they heard Governor Cuomo's executive order of wherein they don't have to pay rent. But see, that's not it. He did not say you don't have to pay rent. It's if you were actually affected. Anyway, they took advantage of the situation and my buyers <laughs> wanted to move in and could not. My sellers wanted to sell and could not and they were held at a standstill until the tenants decided to move. This is not a new story. This is a reoccurring story. And this is why I say to the landlords, you got to talk to your local government. You have to find out about some bills that have actually been passed to help you in this sense. I mean, a lot of tenants I know are saying, well, boohoo for the landlord. They're okay. But actually, sometimes they're not okay. If you're looking to be a landlord now and looking to get a mortgage now, guess what? A lot of the banks are not allowing to use that potential or future rental income to qualify you for a higher mortgage to buy that property. Because they're saying you need to have X amount of um, months in reserve to pay this mortgage. They're saying that you, even if it's a, say it's a $900,000 property, a small two family, and the rental income would have been 2000, 75% of that rental income typically would have helped you to qualify for that home. Now, a lot of banks are saying, we will not count that rental income. What are the, and even doing that, it's slowing down the commercial market. Now, for those of you who are currently landlords, I implore you, reach out to your councilman, reach out to your assembly person, reach out to your senator. There are bills that have been passed, and I mentioned one of them in my slides, but there's more. You have to reach out to them. You have to ask them what provision or protection has been put in place that I can educate my tenants about. Because at the end of the day, we don't want this to be war. It's not tenant against landlord and landlord against tenant. How can it be when you both have one thing in common and that's the roof over your head, right? So go to local government, ask them about the bills that have been passed and ask them if there is even room in their budget to handle this pandemic because they are putting money aside in their budgets to handle this but landlords are some landlords don't know to go to them so i'm imploring everyone on the line if you're a landlord go to them ask them what do they have and if they don't have anything i bet you they can point you to someone in local official government that does that's great that's great advice um a question for paula uh, in terms of you know if someone you know uh finally closes on a home and uh, now they're moving. Uh, are there any obstacles in, in moving? You know, are these moving companies, especially, you know, in Queens, we haven't really rolled out. We're only in our phase one. Are there any um, obstacles uh, with working with moving companies or, you know, someone moves into this home and people haven't really cleaned it out properly? People are worried, you know, about the pandemic. Uh, have you seen anything? Not yet, oh, no. say too soon. Yeah, it's too soon to tell. I'm sure that they're going to try to ensure the best um, possible um, disinfecting and you know preparation of their employees, uh, the workers that will be doing the moves. But I think that you might also get a backlog of people that have to move because everything has been on hold for so long. And I think you're going to find that with a lot of businesses that you're just going to have to wait, just like Natasha said. As far as the courts, there's going to be a back backlog of court cases when the courts do open up for uh, 
for um, um, evictions. That you're not going to get it in September 1st. You may wind up getting it next year. So, and this is what I'm dealing with with a person that wanted to put two buildings on the market and had to, you know, evict their tenants. Tenants know what the story is and they're taking advantage. Now, did the city say to the landlords, hey, we're going to abate your real estate taxes along with everything else? No, there's no breaks for the landlord, as Natasha just mentioned before. So, again, where will you see the um, effects of this on landlords and in multi story buildings? You may see it in the services, you may see it in the condition or the cleaning. Something's got to give if there's no money there. So, you know, as far as this, the, the safety of the building, there's just certain things that they cannot get away from, like elevator inspections and things like that. Um, gas issues, you know, heat, hot water, all of these things. They're the basic necessities, but we'll, what will suffer is the extra quality of life. Things, I think. And I'm sure with all this backup, you're going to have a lot of activity going up and down these elevators and everything where, again, these buildings are, you know, already saying, you know, one person per elevator and how they're going to monitor and manage that probably going to be, uh, you know, a big undertaking, I'm sure. Did you want to say something, Natasha? Uh, we have you on mute. If you just unmute yourself, I wasn't sure. Just saying that that seems to be, for lack of better wording, a nightmare. Because now landlords will be expected to hire some type of personnel or do some type of shared, you know, job sharing, where their responsibility will be dealing with sanitization or, you know, any type of personal protection, if you will. It's definitely going to affect the quality of life for tenants and how that will play out will vary whether it's a large corporation that's the landlord or whether it's truly a mom and pop. So there's more to come and more to see how this is going to evolve. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you still can hear me because I can see my computer is the connection is going in and out. Yeah. Sue, do we have any uh, question and answer? It, anybody? Yes. So um, okay. yeah, I don't see it. Um, okay. about the New York City real estate market, I think that the that those that live in Manhattan apartments will be looking for houses and more space. So how does that affect Manhattan? Well, that's where I think you're going to find the biggest drop in Manhattan. I think you're going to see very, very high vacancy rates in Manhattan. And I think they're also before this even happened. I think they were taking a big hit from places like Long Island City and Brooklyn. Um, you know, my son lives in Long Island City. The amount of building that's going on there is staggering. Uh, I was in um, uh, Brooklyn right over the, um, what bridge is that, by uh, Flatbush in the beginning of it, um, Brooklyn Bridge, I guess. The buildings that are going up there, it's staggering. So people do want to get out of Manhattan, but I think this has really propelled them to do even more. So you're going to see high vacancy rates. I've heard as high as 70% off on um, leasing in Manhattan. So that's where you see, you know, a big, big difference, but we're not seeing it here in the boroughs. Oh, wow. So how do we take advantage of that? <laughs> do you want to live in Can, can I finally afford my penthouse apartment? <laughs> is this the moment, ladies? Is this the moment, finally? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to address it now, you know, in a hazmat suit, but... Right. I'll, you know, wait it out for two years, but then I'll have this beautiful apartment at what? $100,000 $100, maybe? <laughs> yeah. That remains to be seen. I know. Sue, um, do we have yes. another question? Yes. So let's say, um, see, uh, for the rates, uh, so the rates for home buyers currently are low. Do you suggest that current home buyers um, refinance since the rates are low as well? Yes, definitely. This is the time. Uh, the key is to stay with the same lender that you're with. And I had personal experience with this many years ago when I tried to do a refi. We refinanced like seven times, starting from 10% and working our way down many years ago. But if you go to a different lender, you will pay this extra tax called the assignment of the mortgage, which will add a few thousand dollars to your closing costs. You don't want that. You want to negotiate with your current bank if your credit and income is good you will get a much more favorable. If you can get a drop in at least 1%, it's worth it to do a refi, depending on the fees. Definitely. Great, thank you. And for those that are interested in real estate, where can they go to learn more? 
Uh, uh, Natasha, you want to jump in? Sorry, just want to give Natasha. I was going to say everywhere. It feels like everywhere you go, everyone's talking about real estate. I would recommend if you are interested in real estate and learning more, I'm mentioning an association and it's LIBOR, Long Island Board of Real Estate. And why am I saying that? Because they, and Brooklyn Board of Real Estate, because I can't leave Brooklyn out. BBOR, LIBOR, LIBOR or BBOR. And the reason why I'm saying that these are the associations that are, again, hyper local. They know what's happening within the local market. And then they can talk to you about statistics. They can talk to you about where, what markets are hot. Okay, I just think both between Paul and I, we both said New York is hot. Commercial is soft, Manhattan is soft, but the rest of New York is hot. So definitely you have to go to LIBOR or BBOR. And if you just wanna find local real estate stats, can I be um, honest and say, even though Zillow has great stats, kudos to them, go to MLSLI.com, go to BrooklynMLS.com for more accurate data. I think that's the best way to say it, Paula, right? More yes. accurate data. Accurate. Yeah, we don't trust Zillow. And Zillow even has Oh, a, really? Interesting. Yeah, we don't Zillow and we don't um we don't particularly care for Zillow. Zillow is just mm. to take our money and miss <laughs> and miss the public. So these they are, you know, they're not favored, but unfortunately they become the voice of real estate. But so, here's the thing, Paula. Zillow, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to um over talk. That's okay. Zillow with their Zestimates. Okay, can't we just have two seconds on these Zestimates? First of all, you don't have a live person going to this house like Paul and I who know the area, who know the market, who even know some of the homeowners that are living there and the, and the prospective tenants, like we know the area. And then people are looking online and saying, hey, I have a Zestimate and this Zestimate said this house is worth X, Y, and Z. Someone physically didn't go there. What is the condition of the home? What are the property characteristics? There's so much data that's missing, but yet people rely on this Zillow estimate. That's when you look at it, you ask, what is it based on? No one physically has gone. When, when Paul and I do what's called comps or comparative analysis, we're doing it one based on the experience that we have in that area, but then two, we're doing it based on the property types, whether it's a Cape, whether it's a colonial, whether it's, whether it's a townhouse, whatever it may be, all of these are grouped in one category. Right. And then they just throw out a number, apples to accurate. Apples it's to apples. never apples to apples, it's not. Right. And then people look at it as because it's data and it's online, it's accurate, but it's not accurate. It's inaccurate, grossly inaccurate. Don't you people are relying on this for data. Zillow is located. Mm -hmm. Zillow is located in Seattle. What does Seattle know about New York, Paula? Just tell me, because right. I'm missing it. What do they know? I didn't know. I didn't really. Interesting. I didn't know it was located. Okay. Well, you know, it's like uh, with some of this video conferencing, you know, uh, Zoom is really, you know, has, has the name for itself. Uh, a little bit over, I think, WebEx. Although after today, I would really like to work with zoom because webex is really driving me crazy today. <laughs> so in this case zoom might deserve uh, all, all the uh, notoriety for sure uh, but one one last question because i know we're finished up with questions and i know uh we um we started late and i apologize to everyone again but uh whatever it is with technical issues with with you were i know when we were doing the test run you know you were saying everybody's running out to the suffolk county uh, I'm sure they're running out to the Hamptons. I do hear a lot of people looking at that. And um, it's interesting, like I'm hearing out in Montauk, they're not opening up any of the restaurants. It's really causing a problem to a lot of the, even the hotel owners. Uh, so, you know, you may be escaping out to Suffolk County, uh, but there could be, you know, some, some limitations right now uh, with the pandemic. But, uh, you know, now what does that mean for that market out there? It's obviously going to go sky high, but what's the availability too? Are you finding now, is there anything on the market that's available if everybody's running out there? You said 70% vacancy, so that could be a, a, a big mass mass exodus. Yes, right? that's, that's what I, that's what I So, so you, do you hear, is there, is there, um, Availabilities? Is there availability, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that there are. I don't know the Suffolk market that well, mm -hmm. but um, you know, uh, just from my own personal experience with my brother and his wife looking for a house in Long Island, uh, they they had a tough time getting something in their price range about a year and a half, two years ago. 
So they wound up in, in Deer Park, which is a beautiful area. But I'm sure that the Suffolk prices have gone up just like Nassau and Queens. The prices are going up, they're not coming down. So the buyers are hoping that, you know, that there's, there's some desperation out there, there's not. And this is the whole thing. I think that it stretches from uh, Queens, Brooklyn, uh, all the way out, out east. And like I said you know, before, Natasha's numbers for Barton Sullivan, you're going to see those numbers go up. So, you know, those areas are going to see a boom also. Uh, several years back, I spoke at a conference up in Greene County for the Women's Council of Realtors, and I was so surprised. I mean, we were about an hour and a half north of the city, and I'm shocked by the kinds of um, issues that, that these ladies were talking about that they you know, the taxes were going up. And these are people that came from Brooklyn and Queens and they moved up there for the quality of life. And they were having the same problems that we have here up there. And I said, why is that? Well, they said, we don't want the develop overdevelopment of our area because we like it the way it is. Yet, if we don't take on this development, the taxes will rise. And isn't that strange to hear that from a place that's so far away? I was shocked at that kind of, you know, outcry from these from these people. Did I lose you? I lost you. Okay. I see yeah. you. Yeah, I can see it's a connection again. It's not too good, but uh, yeah, I mean, everyone I talk to right now, they're all saying, you know, where do we go? I'm leaving New York. You know, I can't take it with the pandemic. It's really been. Uh, it hasn't been it hasn't been easy. I know a friend of mine. He's a young family, uh, and they, you know, they want to leave. But now the, some of them are leaving completely. They're going out of state. State. Uh, they are looking at Florida. Some people are looking at Nashville. Uh, maybe the Carolinas. I don't know. But then when you look at the country, some of these states, in terms of the pandemic, they're. They're not doing that well either. So I don't know if running is the answer because I think everyone is almost in the same boat. Correct. So it'll be interesting, you know, interesting to see. But thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Uh, it's great to have our alumni, uh, you know, participate. And we're really proud of uh, everything that you're doing out there and, and helping uh, businesses as well as uh, People, you know, they're residential, the families helping them uh, get settled and, and do it in a, in a safe way. Um, before we close, you have uh, Natasha, any quick uh, closing comments? Just, you mentioned Suffolk, and I just want to make one note about Suffolk. What's exciting about Suffolk, or even on the borderline of Nassau County to Suffolk County, is the taxes for right now are relatively low. You're dealing with you know, in Queens or the Bronx, 20 by 100 lot, 25 by 100, you know, 30 by 100, 40 by 100, and that's still good space. But when you go out to Suffolk, you're looking at 60 by 100 or 80 by 120. Like, there's just more, it's like you're practicing social distancing without attempting to do so. And so Suffolk County, you might see an upsurge. A lot of the downtown areas and the different villages are looking to revitalize. And I don't think that was because they anticipated the virus, but it's just that they were doing that anyway, because that was part of their five year and 10 year outlook. So I, I'm seeing that people are being open because the price points are relatively lower, not low, but relatively lower if you're comparing it to Queens and then and comparing it to Nassau. And if you're comparing to Nassau and Suffolk, the taxes are lower right now in Suffolk than it is in Nassau. So for that reason, I'm seeing people are now being open to going out further which mean, might mean they're like an hour and a half out from the city and they're jumping on the LIRR and paying that monthly pass. But they're saying, you know what, when I think about it right now, I'm out there I'm, and everyone is back to, hey, going to the park, not going to the mall, spending time with family on the weekends and doing a barbecue and not heading. So the dynamics have shifted. And what we're seeing now is people are spending more time with people, not shopping, not, they're, not, they're not taking life for granted, if you will. And they're just taking advantage of everything that's possible. Fresh air. As funny as it sounds, fresh air. So there's a lot of shifts that are occurring right now. And I just hope that everyone who is looking adjusts to the shift, understand that real estate is now virtual and take advantage of the fact that rates have been the lowest that I've seen. Take advantage of it, because it won't be here forever. And you want to be able to lock in at a good rate. And for the landlords out there, hang on, things will get better. 
make sure you have a good real estate professional that can help you guide the way. Good advice. Thank you. Paula, any last words? I enjoyed this. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you all. And uh, thank you for your help with the technical difficulties. <laughs> this is a challenge for me. Well, that was Sue. That certainly was a me today. That's for sure. Well, this concludes our power hour on real estate. Uh, I know I said we were doing, you know, for the summer schedule, it was going to be bi-weekly. We changed our time from 1 a.m. to 10, uh, 1 p.m. to 10 a.m., which I hope is a little easier now that it's summer and everyone's getting getting outdoors but we do have a special edition next week i'm so excited we're going to have conversations with mike craig who is our athletic director at saint john's university and one of our um wonderful generous donors uh kevin reed uh he may even be on the call today uh he is going to interview uh, Mike Craig. So I think it's going to be a great conversation, very interesting. So I hope you can join us uh, next Tuesday at 10 a.m. And then the following week, I'm really excited, and this is going to be another challenge uh, with WebEx. We're going to have a cooking show uh, with Chef Danny. Great credentials. Uh, he's going to be out barbecuing, and he's going to give you those great grilling tips so we can have a delicious, delicious barbecue for 4th of July. Because like you were saying, Natasha, everyone's staying home. They're finally enjoying their kitchens, these huge kitchens they have that no one ever really cooks in, right? And their beautiful yards and backyards. Everyone's finally enjoying all of that. So we thought we would, we would offer these great uh, cooking tips so that you're ensured to have a wonderful barbecue. And for all the fathers, if we have any that are on the call today, happy Father's Day. I hope you have a great weekend. It's supposed to be beautiful weather, but thanks again. Thanks for joining our Power Hour and it's great to stay connected to our alumni. Uh, so thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you, Natasha. Thanks, Paula. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.